ladies and gentlemen, um, it's let me now introduce our special guest uh, for this evening. So our resource speaker is our very own um, uh, fellow Thomasian. She's a holder of a PhD in chemical engineering obtained from the University of Cambridge, Clare Hall, with a dis dissertation funding granted by the Schlumberger Foundation Faculty for the Future Fellowship. Our very own alumna, she finished her bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, magna cum laude, and was a recipient of Rector's Award for Academic Excellence. She also ranked first in her class um, in college and was the third placer nationwide at the Philippine Chemical Engineering Licensure Exams in 1993. While excelling academically, noteworthy to mention here are some of her engagements beyond academics, such as her being Butya ng Lahi Awardee by USD, winner of Miss Quezon City 1989, Binibining Pilipinas Maha in 1989, second runner-up at the Maha International 1989 held in the Dominican Republic, truly a Thomasian pride. Her interests include scholarly publishing, chemical sciences, fluid dynamics research, chemical engineering, and climate-related environmental sustainability concerns. At present, she is a publisher of the Royal Society of Chemistry, a learned society in the United Kingdom, advancing excellence, connecting chemical scientists, and shaping the future of the chemical sciences for the benefit of humanity. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, to talk about research beyond metrics, perspectives from science, let us welcome let us welcome back home our fellow Thomasian, our Thomasian pride, truly, who has done a Thomasian mark in her field, Dr. Jean Therese H. Andres. Hello. Good evening. Thank you very much, Dr. Gina, for that very kind introduction. And um, it's a real pleasure for me to be, to be here. Um, I'm going to share my slide. Um, I told um, your team that I wanted to manage my slides. So let me just give me 10 seconds to do that. And I hope you're able to see my slide. Yes. So, um, Thank you very much again. And um, it's a bright, sunny summer's day here in Cambridge. And I'm, uh, as I said, it's a real privilege and an honor for me to be here. And um, thank you to my very good friend, um, Dr. Jovi Carino, who is uh, the chair of the USD Department of Philosophy for inviting me to be part of this series of discussions in celebration of the department's 10th anniversary. So many congratulations, and may God favor you with many more decades of shaping hearts and minds in wisdom and in love. On a personal note, apart from um, Dr. Carino being my friend for over 25 years, I also have a special affinity for philosophy because my brother studied here and graduated with a degree in AB philosophy many years back. So it's really a blessing and a privilege to be among you today to celebrate your anniversary and to talk about research and how its impacts might be measured. So since you heard a lot about me during the introduction, I'd like to start by finding out more about you, if that's okay. And um, I think Gian will send something in the chat or has sent something in the chat right now. Um, if you click on that Slido link, there is a little poll, which I hope is working. If not, um, let's see what happens. So this is just for fun. Let's see if we are getting people to answer. There's one person who's tried. Um, I just want to know um, more about who 
um, is uh, joining us here during our discussion. So I can help to uh, tailor our, um, uh, our topics and what I should focus on and for me to get to know you. Great. We're seeing uh, members of faculty and students. That's really nice to see. I'll give you uh, around 15 more seconds to join the chat. Don't worry if you can't click on it, it's fine. This is just for fun. It's great to see a lot of engagement. Over 20 of you have, um, have told me about yourself. So thank you very much for welcoming me. Uh, thank you to all of the faculty members who have given up their Saturday evenings to join, uh, to join us for this session. And to all of the wonderful students of philosophy um, looking at your profile pictures, I feel very energized. And uh, it really is wonderful to be home. And of course, to all of those who are um, students or, or faculty members uh, from outside of philosophy, you're very welcome as well. So thank you very much for that. Um, so it's nice to know a bit more about who's in the room, uh, but just to summarize um, the very, you know, um, wonderful, but uh, quite long introduction that you heard about me earlier. And I told uh, Dr. Gina that it's, it's, it's because I've lived a long life, so I have a long list. Um, here is a shorter overview of my journey from uh, my home, USD, where I was born and where my mind was formed, to academic publishing, where I am today. So um, as you heard, I am a publisher at the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, which I shortened to call RSC. Um, and uh, I joined the RSC as a development editor in 2012. So uh, that's an entry level position. Um, the journals that I've worked on um, are obviously in the chemical sciences. So uh, they include our flagship journal and uh, Chemcom, uh, Chemical Communications, Chemical Society Reviews, Energy and Environmental Science, Nanoscale, um, and uh, other journals as well. Um, I did my PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Cambridge um, in environmental fluid dynamics, focusing on carbon dioxide sequestration. So how to um, model the behavior of carbon dioxide when it's injected into the ground so that we can um, reduce the amount of CO2 that we emit into the atmosphere. Uh, I previously taught in USD um, for a stint. I, I uh, was uh, teaching at the Faculty of Engineering and then afterwards at the College of Science. And I was also involved in environmental education research. So it was at this point during this time that I first became friends with Dr. Carino. And uh, it was during, I think, our preparations for World Youth Day at that time. And um, it was uh, the start of a very wonderful friendship. And now um, we are still good friends up to this point. I worked for four years uh, with the Christ Youth in Action, which is a national Catholic movement for young people. So what is the RSC? Uh, we are a learned society committed to helping the chemical science community to make the world a better place. We have over 54,000 members all across the world. Uh, we are a leading international not-for-profit publisher and uh, we act as the voice of the chemical sciences community to push forward scientific policy and education and we run conferences and events all throughout the world as well. We are a global community and our offices are located around the world as you can see here, but our, our main headquarters are in the UK and uh, in Cambridge where I'm based, uh, that's where the heart of our publishing um, activities are done 
and our um, stately building, you know, our premises in London is really um, very historic and uh, one you should visit if you're able in the, uh, ever in the neighborhood. Um, aside from being a learned society, we are also a leading international publisher. So we publish ebooks, books, um, journals, databases, and magazines. So let me tell you about my role as a publisher of RSC journals. I am in, am in charge of 16 out of 42 international journals across diverse chemi chemistry areas. Um, I manage five executive editors, each of whom leads a team of, uh, of editors who run a portfolio of journals. And um, I have 60 people reporting indirectly into me. Um, I work with 200 editorial board members. And of my 16 journals, four of those are co-owned or in partnerships. So I manage those external relationships. Now, um, I also run an annual badge budget of a few million um, pounds. Um, but let me ask you now, after hearing that, do these really show the value of what I do? Do they give an idea of any excellence? Do they demonstrate any impact that I'm making? What if I told you instead that I help set and deliver publishing strategies, including on open access and transformative journals, that I launch new journals and thus expanding our portfolio and reach, that I manage our resources carefully, looking after staff well being and productivity, that I review budgets and forecasts to generate surplus to give back to the chemical science community because all of our profit is uh, put back to help the community and it doesn't go into anybody's um, pockets. Uh, what if I told you that I manage and develop people, supporting managers, and that I collaborate with academics and uh, people from all over the world to make, um, to help the chemical science community make the world a better place? Which version told you more about the impact of what I do? It's not a perfect analogy, but there is a similar perspective that I would like to offer with regard to how the value, impact, and excellence of research is measured, or how an attempt is made to measure these. So the question of how to measure the impact of research, whether in the natural and physical sciences, or in the social sciences and humanities, is far from new. For example, back in 2014, the Canadian Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences, which is a nonprofit charitable organization with a mandate to promote the value of research and learning in the humanities and social sciences. They launched this ambitious project that aimed at developing metrics for measuring the impacts of social sciences and humanities within and beyond the academe. The draft document in 2014 proposed some indicators for the measurement of impact around five dimensions. So one is impacts on scholarship, impacts on capacity, on economy, on society and culture, on practice and policy. So that was just one example um, of how discussions in this area have been going on even before uh, 2014, a long, long time uh, before that. How research is assessed varies by country, by funding agency, by subject area. So, uh, for example, the Research Excellence Framework, or REF, is the UK system for assessing the quality of research in UK higher education institutions. Um, it was first carried out in 2014. Uh, replacing the previous research assessment exercise. Um, it, was, um, it is managed by Research England on behalf of all four UK 
by higher education funding bodies. So the four nations comprising the United Kingdom, England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And the REF outcomes inform allocation of around two billion pounds per year of public funding for university research. So um, the research excellence framework, the current REF exercise received over 185,000 research output submissions until this March with outcomes due next year in April. 157 UK universities are participating in the current exercise of REF and expert panels for each of the 34 subject-based units of assessments or UOAs will assess submissions. These panels are made up of senior academics, international members and research users. These UOAs span disciplines from medicine, biology and public health to physics, chemistry, mathematics, to social sciences, law, economics, to the arts and humanities, including languages, communication, and philosophy. For each submission in every UOA, three elements are assessed. The quality of outputs, for example, the publications, the performances, the exhibitions, and second, the impact beyond academia. And lastly, the environment that supports the research. If you're interested to know more about this, they have put their uh, panel criteria and working methods on their website, which is here on the slide here. So this is just an example of how one country assesses research quality. There are many variations and approaches, but because of my work, I happen to have more exposure to the UK system. Which brings me to a couple of disclaimers. First of all, um, I am unfortunately not an academic. I'm not teaching in university. So I don't have firsthand experience of research assessment, just background knowledge. And second, my knowledge is mainly in science publishing, not in humanities or social sciences publishing. I'll present what I know so you can compare the landscape with yours. But in this talk, I do not attempt to cover humanities and social sciences specifically. So that's what I don't know. What I do know, however, is that the framework of research assessment acts as a powerful driver for author researcher choices, for what an academic researcher chooses, what they aim for, and how they behave. Do they focus on um, quality versus quantity? Do they want their publications to be impactful or do, do they want to be prolific? Do they focus on citations or numbers of papers or societal impact? If they are in the natural sciences, are they going to do fundamental research or applied? Are they going to focus on generating results and breakthrough or in exploration and discovery? Do they focus on the values and the culture that shape the research environment around them? If they are a mentor, how do they run their research group? How, what values do they pass on to their students and researchers? Which reminds me of this cartoon I first saw when I was doing my PhD, showing how the way to being published is fraught with collegial blows to one's work and how rejections can lead one's academic career to perish. How about you? Maybe you've already asked yourselves this question. Is publishing your research a burden? Is it an extra task that's separate to your teaching or to your studies? Is it simply a requirement to be met, a box to be ticked? What motivates you to publish? At this point, I'd like to um, ask you to participate, if you will, in another quick poll. And it's the same link as before. And again, it's for fun. Um, I'd like you to consider some options and choose all that apply or all that you agree with. 
So if you're able to go and uh, look at the choices, please answer um, and choose all the uh, answers that apply to your situation. I don't know if people are able to access. It's nice to see the answers coming in real time. It's really exciting. This is the first time I'm doing this, by the way. So it's really fun. It makes for a more interactive um, conversation. It's very interesting to see that 60% of us in this room um, say that there is an expectation of a certain number of articles or books that they, are, uh, they should publish. It's part of their role. And a good number are planning to submit a manuscript in the next 12 months. Publications are evaluated against benchmarks or metrics for future grant funding or career progression. And a third of us in this room have already published a book or a peer reviewed journal article in the last 12 months. Hooray. There is a small proportion um, who feel that they don't need to publish their work to progress in their studies or in their academic career. And for that, uh, for those uh, people who answer the 4% um, or the 8% now, um, uh, I hope you're still interested in the topic of publication and uh, that you will be interested in um, in the rest of the of what I'm going to say. Thank you very much for engaging with this poll. And uh, it's very um, good to see that it seems that the next part of my um, talk will be relevant to most of you because you are planning to submit. Uh, there is an expectation on you to publish and you feel that your publications are assessed against benchmarks or metrics for future grants and, and career progression. So thank you very much. I'd like to go to the next slide um, if that's all right with you, but thank you very much for engaging in this fun polls. So for scientific researchers, um, uh, there are many motivators for publishing just as you have your own motivations for publishing. And these are all valid. valid. So scientists want to contribute to the advancement of science. And by publishing, they're helping to establish the scientific priority, which focus areas should be pursued uh, for scientific progress. They want to create a permanent record of their results and their findings and to, to share this information and to disseminate it with their peers. They want to promote their research. And of course, there are the more pragmatic reasons, um, which uh, is to do with furthering their career and to get funding. So the question is, how is the framework of research assessment influencing the balance of these different motivators? Is research publication driven by a healthy mix of these, or is it somewhat skewed towards the more pragmatic motivators? For researchers in general, whether in, in the arts and humanities or in the sciences, some benefits to publishing are by subjecting your work to impartial, uh, impartial expert scrutiny, it is improved. By reviewing others' work, you are forced to think critically about other research questions. By publishing and reviewing, you build up a reputation as an active thinker and researcher who interacts with their community. It's also a form of quiet networking. As editors, reviewers, and readers get to know you 
and they form an opinion of you based on your portfolio of work. Your work contributes to advancing our collective repository of knowledge. And of course, there's a requirement again for a career progression and for needing to get funding. Which of these speak most to you? Think about how your research is assessed and how this framework influences your choices and behavior as an academic researcher. So my theory is that the framework of research assessment acts as a powerful driver for what an academic researcher chooses and what they aim for and how they behave. What are these influences then? What are some of the publication metrics that are more commonly used in some research assessments? First of these is the journal impact factor. It's often used as a primary parameter for comparing scientific output of individuals and institutions. Um, very simplistically, it is a ratio between the citations in a given year and recent citable publication items. Um, for example, a two-year journal impact factor for 2020 would be calculated as the total citations in the year 2020 to items that were published in the two years previous to that, 2018 and 2019, divided by the total number of citable items published in those two years. Some of you may already know this, um, so I'm just um, explaining this for completeness for whoever is watching this recording later. It was created originally by Thomson Reuters, but is now published by Clarivate Analytics, as uh, Dean Malou mentioned in her uh, um, in, in her talk uh, in her uh, uh, opening remarks uh, earlier on. And it was originally intended as a tool to help librarians identify which journals they should buy rather than as a measure of scientific quality of the research that's published. So that's very interesting to know the original motivation for setting up this average metric. Another um, uh, metric that's commonly used is called the immediacy index. And it's the average number of times an article is cited in the year that it's published. So you, you will see a certain trend in all of these metrics. It's always an average of citation performance versus the number of articles. But you know the, the, the parameters are a little bit different for each. It's often used as an indicator of how quickly articles in a journal are cited. If they're noticed and they're referenced in the same year, then there's a higher immediacy index and the formula, the equation is shown there. Another metric that's used, and this is mostly to um, pertain to authors, is the H index. The H index value is based on a list of publications ranked in descending order by the number of times cited. So in other words, an index of H, let's say 20, means that there are 20 papers in that art, uh, author's portfolio that have each been cited at least 20 times. So it's often used to indicate both an author's productivity, the papers that they have published, and the citation impact of their publications. So the focus is on having a consistent body of work rather than just one-off breakthroughs. You have one paper that's been cited millions of times and you know that skews your results. So the H index is a way of, of um, showing consistency and um, building up um, a certain body of work. There are issues about H index um, though. The problem is it's not easily comparable across research fields. Typical H scores in one field are often higher or lower than in others. And you have to remember here that it's because most of these metrics are based on two factors, the number of citations and the number of articles. So let's, let me just walk you through a few things. I'm, I'm not going to bore you with too many graphs today, 
but just a few things that I discovered while I was preparing for this talk. Looking at uh, this graph, um, which I took from um, the Web of Science. So Clarivate um, Analytics has um, other products aside from Web of Science. They have um, insights and they have the, the journal citation reports. And here I looked at the number of articles published in a five year period, 2016 to 2020 by research area. And I chose a few representative research areas. So one is chemistry, multidisciplinary, and another is biochemistry and molecular biology. Another is physics, multidisciplinary. Another is social sciences, interdisciplinary, and anthropology is in blue, the fifth down the, 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 uh, the list there. And last but not least, it's philosophy. You can see the relative number of articles published and the great variation across them. They are in different orders of magnitude. There's um, over half a million papers published in that five year period for chemistry multidisciplinary alone, while for um, anthropology, it is one full order of magnitude lower at 52,000 papers. So that's already a, an indicator that there we can expect some differences in the way the metrics will vary across each research area. Breaking it down further by year. So the, um, the numbers, uh, uh, the years that you see here are represented by the different colors in the charts. You can see the growth, for example, in the chemistry uh, multidisciplinary field. You can see the rapid growth in their number of publications per year over those five years. And you can see the relatively flatter growth in social sciences, anthropology, and philosophy. So the rate of growth um, of these publications, the publishing market, if you will, for those different research categories are very different. In terms of citations, Research areas have differences in citation culture. Authors may cite others more in some fields, usually in the natural and physical sciences. Here we see that total citations in a year between say chemistry and the social sciences can vary by up to five orders of magnitude. How will it be possible to compare the impact of research output in those areas if the metrics used are not normalized to each category's baselines or typical values? This is why in the UK, it makes sense that research assessments are done according to four main groups that I mentioned earlier with 34 units of assessment. There is no one bar which is used across the breadth of all disciplines. Another way to look at it is by considering the top journal impact factors on web of science. Um, let me just see if annotation works um, here. So if you see here, the journal impact factors, and I've ordered this from um, highest to lowest in the uh, journal citation reports. We see that for philosophy, for example, the highest journal impact factor is 4.4. But when we look at the list of journals for multidisciplinary chemistry, for example, we see that the category's top journals have impact factors in the high 30s to 60s. How can there be any comparison when assessing research outputs of academics from these different fields unless the metrics are not benchmarked in some way? or if they are not used as the main parameter for assessment. This is indeed one of the pitfalls of a solely metrics-based research assessment. If we rely only on certain metrics to generalize the citation impact of publications, we are effectively using these as surrogates for real assessment based on the quality of individual research. 
And this was one reason why in June 2020, so last year, the RSC became the first major chemical society in the world to sign up to DORA, which is the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment. We signed because we realized that our values align with the principles of DORA and that those principles are in line with what we are seeing taking place in the external landscape. So what is DORA? This declaration was developed in 2012 at the annual meeting of um, the American Society for Cell Biology in San Francisco. It's a set of recommendations aimed at improving ways in which the output of research is evaluated by funding agencies, institutions, and other parties. And there are certain themes that run through the recommendations. Um, first is the need to eliminate the use of journal-based metrics, just as journal impact factors in funding, appointment, and promotion considerations, the need to assess research on its own merits rather than on the basis of the journal in which the research is published, and the need to capitalize on the opportunities provided by online publications. So those are the key themes that run through DORA. And as I mentioned in its beginnings, this was how uh, DORA came about. A group of editors and publishers of scholarly journals met during this annual meeting uh, of this society and developed a set of recommendations. And they invited people and institutions across all scientific disciplines to, to indicate their support by adding their names to DORA. So we are seeing a global shift in the way that research is assessed. And the support for DORA is widespread and it's still growing now because of the global shifts towards increasing the transparency, inclusivity and openness in research and research assessment. It's starting to be seen as an important way of supporting a fairer research culture. Open research movement champions DORA. It's supported by major research funders in the UK and the majority of UK uh, universities are signatories. So if you're interested to know how the UK institutions are assessing their re research, their signing up to DORA will tell you a lot about their intentions and their vision. As I said, the general recommendation is not to use journal-based metrics as a surrogate measure of the quality of individual research articles and, uh, not, and not to use those to assess an individual science's contributions or in hiring, promotion, or funding decisions. For funding agencies, they're um, saying that the recommendation is not, uh, to be explicit about what criteria are being used to evaluate the scientific productivity of applicants and to highlight especially, and this means there's going to be a culture change, that for early stage investigators, it's more important that their paper has robust scientific content rather than being published in a high impact factor journal, for example. And for purposes of research assessment, consider the value of impact of all research outputs. So not just the articles, but also the data sets, the software, the actual work that has gone into producing that work. For institutions, this might be interesting for USC to consider. Be explicit about the criteria used to reach hiring, tenure, and promotion decisions, clearly highlighting, especially for early stage investigators, again, that it's more important um, that the content of what you publish is high quality rather than the metrics or where your uh, work will be published. For purposes of research assessment, it's the same thing, um, using all of the available um, data sets and research outputs in the evaluation. So who has signed DORA? Close to 20,000 individuals and organizations in 148 countries comprising funders, universities, societies, publishers, metric suppliers um, have signed up. Among these 24 individuals and institutions are in philosophy. Yes, DORA is not limited to one research uh, a particular set of research, it, it encompasses all disciplines. 
Signatories from Southeast Asia include those from these countries, but there's no signatory yet from the Philippines. Will the UST Department of Philosophy become the first Philippine signatory to DORA? Let's see. So to recap, today we talked about how research is assessed. We talked a little bit about the UK system for this. Um, we talked about how research assessment frames and drives scientific research and publishing and the author choice and behavior, and how the nature of publication met metrics makes it difficult to compare research output from different research categories. Physical natural sciences can't be compared with those in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. We talked about DORA and how it aims to make the evaluation of research fairer for all. So let me leave you with some things to reflect on before we go into questions. As an academic or a student, how do I want my research output to be assessed? What is my end goal? Does the current framework that I'm working within incentivize me to choose the way I do my research and how much to publish and where? Am I conscious of what drives me to publish? Do you know your purpose? What can I do to make research assessment fairer across disciplines within my, and within my own? And as someone working in the humanities and social sciences, I put it to you, is there value in you forging a closer dialogue with colleagues in the natural or physical sciences? What can we learn from each other? So maraming salamat po. Thank you for listening, for your attention, and I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Neff Andres. Maraming salamat um, for such a rich and I'd say relevant discussion, although you claim it's, it's the perspective of your discipline. But I think this is also something that people from the humanities, from the philosophy uh, discipline uh, should also learn from. So thank you for, for that. Uh, it's been uh, it's been interesting listening to, to your um, discussion, how you've presented the, the basics in, um, in journal assessments and the, the, the metrics. So um, at this point, we'd, we'd like to open the floor for questions from the members of the audience. So let me reiterate the instructions for an orderly conduct of the open forum. Those who would like to um, share their questions or give their comments may use the chat box or may use the raise hand button um, um, found uh, below uh, the button the, the icons below the, the screen um, and then wait to be recognized um, as you are recognized please uh, uh, unmute yourself identify yourself your uh, institutional affiliation and proceed with uh, the sharing of the question or the insight uh, to our speaker. In case you uh, would like to share your, um, you have to open your cameras, you're also welcome to do so. Now, for those who would like to share their insights or comments in the chat box, you're also welcome to do that. In fact, we now have several comments or questions in the chat box, uh, Dr. Neff, which I'll be reading in a little while. Okay, so everyone, uh, you're encouraged to share your questions or your thoughts about the discussion of Dr. Andres. Now let's proceed to the question or uh, um, thoughts shared by Sir Mark Stephen Pandan. Uh, let me read the question, Dr. Neff. It is a given that we must strive for both quantity and quality of publication. But suppose we have to choose between the two. Which one should we choose? Does the answer differ by discipline? So that's from Sir Mark Stephen Pandan. Dr. Nett? Thank you for, for that question, Mark. And um, it is true that uh, we face uh, a, a choice here. Um, what strategy do you want to adopt when you're um, starting your um, research career and your publication um, activities? So I would say that. Um, there is some difference according to discipline. You can see, um, you know, in the charts that I showed you earlier, there is a marked difference in the volume of, um, of publications that um, are produced by the different research uh, areas. 
However, that has not been normalized according to number of authors. So be wary of just using those raw numbers. Um, I uh, unfortunately haven't looked up um, the relative size of the communities uh, of those different disciplines. Um, but I suspect that um, there is going to be a larger cohort, I think, in, uh, for example, um, chemistry or um, maths um, or, or uh, biology or medicine um, than there would be in um, anthropology, for example. We saw that the output uh, was relatively smaller. So I think um, it is going to be a personal choice for the researcher how they want to do this. And you have role models to uh, look to in your specific discipline to see how they have approached this question. I think a balance of both uh, personally will work well. Um, aside from differences in um, uh, in terms of discipline, there might be differences in the way that, for example, um, men and women um, approach this. Um, I know that uh, approaches vary and I don't want to generalize, but uh, just from speaking to academics that I know within the chemical sciences, it's a very small um, field and it might be anecdotal, but for many female researchers that I've talked to, they're really focused on um, producing high quality output and um, publishing fewer but higher quality papers that tend to do well. Um, and uh, this is actually backed up a little bit by a study that the RSC did on uh, gender bias in uh, publishing in the chemical sciences where we saw that there was a lot of disproportionate um, biases against um, female, uh, working against uh, female scientists across the publishing pipeline. One of these is that they produce less papers as a whole over their career because they focus on publishing when they feel that they can, that they have something quality, high quality to publish. But their male counterparts um, would not necessarily have uh, those limitations on themselves and they will publish as they produce things. So those um, little things are good to be conscious of. Um, if you're a female researcher, if you're a female um, uh, social scientist and you're wondering, is this good enough to publish? Do I have enough? you're probably overthinking yourself, just submit, just write it up and submit. Um, and uh, again, I don't want to generalize. It can be a man or a woman. It can be an early career researcher or an established academic. But as you grow in confidence in what you're doing, you can, do, um, you can make a decision on what strategy you're going to employ. I hope that helps. Thanks for that, doc, uh, Dr. Net. And it's also uh, interesting to to add that um, in one of the of the articles I I was shared by a colleague, uh, Dr. Fleur Fleur Deliz, uh, Altis, we read that uh, there seems to be more challenge for women researchers uh, to publish their works now in the context of the pandemic, even that uh, there are impacts or implications of the pandemic on the roles of women play, especially mothers play in the household. So there's this uh, concept of multiple burden that women are confronted with, which hinder them from also being productive uh, as their male counterpart in terms of communication or research. So thank you for your response to the question. We have another question or co uh, and comment from our colleague, uh, Dr. Rochi Machenzo. Uh, he expresses congratulations to you for your generous sharing uh, here, here. Um, and the question is, what can you say about philosophical research being done in an empirical way? Do you think this is possible? Or, uh, and is there a future for this in terms of impact to community? Ooh. I'm verging into unknown territory. 
<laughs> thank you very much, um, Dr. Rod Shimachansha, for your uh, very thoughtful question. I do not know a lot about philosophical research um, and uh, how it can be done in an empirical way. Um, I, I don't know enough about the topic, so maybe I can ask for help for some of, from some of your colleagues. Maybe Dr. Gina can help, or maybe um, Dr. Carina can help. Um, I think that um, if uh, it is an empirical approach, um, my guess is that it might appeal to a bigger range of people who aren't necessarily thinking of um, you know, more abstract um, thinking. Uh, uh, they might be more interested in results or things that they um, have, have observed rather than just looking at the logic of things or the flow of things. Um, I know a lot of scientists are like that in the physical and natural sciences, the chemical sciences. Uh, so the appeal will be there for a broader um, set of uh, readers and researchers. Um, the relatability will be there. Um, as to whether it's possible or if there's a future for this, I'm not really sure. Uh, I can't give you any tips, I'm afraid. I am um, a complete... Um, neophyte in philosophy, and I don't want to talk about something I'm ignorant about. So um, if anybody wants to chime in uh, and uh, help Dr. Rochi with, uh, with the answer, please do speak up. We appreciate your comments, Dr. Nett, but um, yeah, uh, I, if, I, I hope I don't preempt the project, but this is something that uh, some of the members of the department uh, wish to put forward. So we are exploring on the possibility of having um, philosophical research in an empirical way. We hope to uh, find the fruit, fruitful um, unfolding in this aspect um, as we ourselves are also uh, quite uh, neophyte to, to this exploration. But we, we hope, I, I, I also believe this is possible and hopefully it will have a future of its own. Thank you for, for... I wish you very well in that. I think there is going to be uh, a lot of promising um, things, doors that will open if you manage to um, come up with a strategy on how to do that. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, one of our uh, co colleagues in, in this um, uh, pursuit is Dr. Franz Cortez, who also uh, has a question for you, Dr. Net. Uh, the, the question reads, if the conventional ways of assessing the impacts of research works are inherently problematic, how and why did it become dominant and prevalent? Pre prevalent. What was it? Was it an over oversight or was it deliberate, probably in the interest of profit or something else? What do you have to say? Your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so uh, we, we, are, um, we, we are ranging into this um, area of speculation because I, uh, of course, don't know the history of this, aside from knowing that the original intention for um, at least the journal impact factor as a metric was to really help librarians to prioritize and choose which journal publications they will subscribe to for their institution. So it was a sales tool in the beginning to quantify um, how much bang for their buck they were going to get uh, by uh, buying certain journals uh, and subscribing to them. So um, I don't know about the other impact factors or the other metrics. Um, it became dominant and prevalent because maybe it is a simple way of looking at things. I think um, people were looking for benchmarks um, that would allow them to um, check whether uh, a journal was worth their time or not. Was it worth reading? 
Was it doing any good? Was it garnering attention among their community? It is just, uh, I think, part of human nature to say that we would go um, and take up what is on offer if it offers us a simple solution to a dilemma and uh, removes the need for scrutinizing a journal. Um, it's related to um, researchers being time poor and not having enough um, uh, you know, of the luxury of time to actually scrutinize whether a journal um, has a good editorial board, um, has robust peer review practices, uh, publishes quality research, um, and is um, you know, driven by uh, a common purpose to theirs. I don't think it was deliberate. I think it snowballed because a lot of people were using it. This is where maybe social sciences can help um, to see how that social behavior uh, um, uh, evolved. Um, I know that in the past, there are some countries or regions in the world where their research assessment framework really hinged a lot on journal impact factors to the point of really offering financial incentives for their researchers uh, whenever they publish in high impact factor journals. Um, again, that landscape is changing and uh, I, I think there is hope, but a lot of people will need to get behind it and um, understand the metrics for what they were supposed to achieve before and use their own judgment to actually assess if an article is actually good or not. I hope that answers the question. Right, right. Evaluate research based on metrics, as you said earlier. Thank you, Doc. So we have another uh, question from Rance Jomil Tamayo. Uh, he shares that uh, your presentation was spectacular. Thank you for your uh, for a quite informative take on the role of research today. He'd like to ask, should philosophy be concerned of the growing dissonance that academias are currently enacting in favor of more empirical research? Humanities are receiving less attention compared to their multidisciplinary counterparts. And I was wondering what we should make of that. So uh, thank you very much, um, Rance, for your question and thank you for your kind words. Um, I think this is connected to the earlier question, isn't it, about uh, empirical research um, in the humanities. Um, again, I would, I, I would say that um, you know, I, I don't know what the... Um, the issues are, it seems to be a very hot topic at the moment. Um, the word here that uh, Rance used was dissonance. Um, so um, does it mean to say that you see there really is an incongruence in, um, in, in um, delving into empirical research for something that involves thinking and logic or um, you know, in, in the humanities, for example, uh, not just in philosophy. Um, but um, I, I um, think um, if the humanities are receiving less attention, um, it might be because of, um, uh, of um, something like that. But also the question to ask is within that particular discipline, in the humanities, within philosophy, for example. What is the culture like in terms of referencing each other's work? Do you build on other people's work, even if they are not empirically based? And um, does the question of attention to other people's research then stem from that? Um, because, um, whether research is empirical or not, um, I think in philosophy, the established approach um, is, it has been there for, for centuries. And um, I think in my mind, the question is, um, 
is the attention within the philosophical community enough? Are those dialogues happening in the form of publications, um, aside from discourse, um, talks, seminars, lectures, debates? Are there discourses in the publishing arena? Is there a record of those discourses? And that could increase the, you know, the attention within the field itself. So I think um, that's something to think about and um, comparing it with uh, other multidisciplinary um, categories or research areas um, is, is all well and good. And I already said there might be some appeal there for you know, uh, researchers. Um, who aren't necessarily um, philosophers by, by nature um, or by training. Um, and um, yes, uh, it, it's um, that dissonance is something that the philosophical community will need to establish for themselves. And I, I heard earlier on from Doc Gina, you said that there is something that's in the works. So um, I hope that everybody will have a chance to um, to participate in those discussions. It seems to be striking a chord here. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Doc. That's the the vision. So hopefully we'll get there uh, in time um, sooner or later. So thank you. Another question from our graduate student, uh, Prince uh, Eric Gapo. Good afternoon, good day, Professor Andres, <laughs> Dr. Andres. Research is often associated with academic elitism, he says. It is understandable that research works are made for the advancement of a particular field and that they are written in order to converse with converse with fellow researchers, fellow research communities through a particular language. I'm harboring this notion that research still remains as a polarizing factor separating the academic and the general public products of research remains ambiguous among the public and it has resulted in the problems concerning truth, fact, and opinion. How should researchers address this particular issue or is it even necessary for research and researchers to converse with the general public? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, Prince. And you have touched on quite a few things that are, I think, very um, relevant to our um, current situation. Let me try and get through this um, like point by point. Um, academic elitism. So by this, I mean, uh, I, I think you mean um, that academics um, speak their own language that is not then easily translated into um, non-academic speak. Um, and I, I, I have to agree, um, but I don't think there is anything that is stopping an academic researcher from being able to fully discourse and um, hold discourse and converse with their fellow researchers using technical language or specialist language, or um, any of the um, baselines, any any baseline definitions that um, are well established in in one's community, um, and they can still shift to a language that is more accessible to non-academics, to people in mainstream media, for example, and. Um, I think that is one of the skills of a good communicator, a good science communicator, for example, is to distill and boil down all of the essentials of a piece of work and translate it into something that's relevant to others in their daily life, whether it's applied research, applied science, or philosophy, um, or sociology, or architecture, or economics. Um, those are two different languages. And I think that academics um, should consider how they 
need to be fluent in both for their research to be relevant to a greater number of people, not just within the, the, the circle um, who already know what they're talking about and, and who already speak that language. So research in itself, I don't think is a polarizing factor because um, the perceptions of the public about research is driven by the kind of language that they hear. If we speak to them in jargon and gobbledygook, then they will not trust um, the message that is uh, enclosed in those words. So we need to make it more accessible to the general public, is, is my opinion. And um, if we are able to communicate that and um, show that there is an elegance to the logic, there is an elegance and a simplicity to the truth, then that will appeal, I think, to a great many. Um, it's when people say things in complicated language that people are put off and they don't want to engage anymore and they don't think that it's relevant to them. But if you think about somebody um, and their situation and you put a little bit of empathy and you think about how they're hearing it from their perspective, that's easier because you're meeting them halfway and you're able to, um, you're helping them to digest your message more easily. So I think it is necessary for researchers to converse with the general public. I think the more mainstream researchers um, go the better because that is the whole purpose of research is to improve life, to improve society, to improve the way that um, we live in this world. And if that is um, sequestered in one area of the community, it's a shame because it doesn't then impact the people who will most benefit from it. I hope that answers that question. Those are my opinions. Yeah, um, thank you for covering the aspects of the, of the questions, uh, Dr. Nett. And I, I like how you have put emphasis on the, on the need to communicate or for, for academics or academic researchers to communicate research um, to the general public. So uh, let me just try to emphasize that, that you mentioned about the, the essential of uh, the academics being able to uh, uh, um, having the need to be fluent on the language of research and being able to translate research to something that is relevant to the daily life uh, as the essence of uh, research ultimately is to improve life. So thank you for that. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, thanks My pleasure. Also expresses his gratitude for answering the question. So. Um, if there are more questions, please uh, type them in um, and uh, we can probably address, uh, entertain one or two more questions if there are still uh, any. Um, we again thank uh, Dr. Andres for generously responding to the questions and of course for the generous mm -hmm. contribution uh, on the discussion uh, she talked about today. So um, if there are no more questions, Thank you again, Dr. Jean Perez uh, H. Andres, for gracing us with your presence as our first speaker for this evening's uh, uh, session. Uh, it's now afternoon uh, in the UK. <laughs> and uh, on behalf of the Faculty of Arts and Letters and the Department of Philosophy, thank you, Dr. Andres. Uh, please virtually receive our um, a token of appreciation, certificate of appreciation for gracing us with your uh, presence as our speaker for today's event. The certificate reads, University of Santo Tomas, Faculty of Arts and Letters, Department of Philosophy, hereby award this certificate of appreciation to Dr. Jean Therese H. Andres of the University of Cambridge Royal Society of Chemistry for giving the lecture titled Research Beyond Metrics, Perspectives from Science, as part of the conference organized on the occasion of the 125th anniversary of the Faculty of Arts and Letters, 
in the 10th anniversary of the Department of Philosophy with the theme, Further Challenges and Prospects, given the 17th day of July, 2021. Signed, Professor Marilu Madunio, PhD, Dean, Faculty of Arts and Letters, University of Santo Tomas, and Associate Professor Vito Carino, PhD Chair, Department of Philosophy, University of Santa Tomas. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Net um, Andres. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And that's a wonderful certificate for me to um, cherish uh, and to remember this wonderful day. I thank you for the opportunity to um, join you for your celebrations. And thank you for really um, engaging questions and for listening and for um, taking part today and giving up your Saturday evening for this event. Thank you so much. Right, thank you as well for sparing us with your time and spending your, is it Saturday yet? Uh, in it's Saturday um, uh, midday, so um, 33 minutes past 12. So thank you. I will take a walk after this in the sunshine okay so thank you um there's well personally a lot of takeaways uh, from your discussion dr net and i hope uh, the members of the audience also had uh, their own takeaways uh, on, on your on your discussion so um again thank you maraming salamat we hope to see you uh, in the in the in the future um hopefully uh, next time face to face uh, me too <laughs> all right so friends ladies and gentlemen uh, we hope that as uh, what i said you had a fruitful uh, time listening to uh, the discussion today and that you also have your own takeaways on the topic we just uh, uh, discussed 